We are joined right now at Says Who Sports by the television voice of the Kentucky Derby in the Preakness in the Breeders' Cup on NBC. The man who caught the biggest lightning in a bottle in the TV broadcast booth twice, who called the first Triple Crown winner in 37 years and called a second Triple Crown winner just a few years later. A man whose name you may not recognize, but whose voice you will, even if you're like me, and you just tune in to watch the Triple Crown races each year, whose name you absolutely know if you follow big time horse racing, because he has called so many big races. A man who will call his 14th consecutive Kentucky Derby for NBC on Saturday, Larry Colmus. Larry, it's an honor. Welcome in to Says Who Sports. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure, John. It's uh, great to be here and 14 straight Kentucky Derbies. I'm feeling old now. You know, we've been doing this for a long time. It's, uh, it's so much fun, though. And uh, this time of year is when everybody gets excited about horse racing and uh, looking forward to it for sure. Oh, man. So well said, Larry. And, and I've been watching you and listening to you, that, that golden tone for, for so many years now. This will be the 14th in a row, as mentioned. Um, you also call, as, as, as we mentioned, the Preakness Stakes and the Breeders' Cup for NBC. You called the Belmont Stakes as well for many years. You grew up in, uh, on the East Coast in Baltimore, right, Larry? And you went with friends to races all over the East Coast as a fan. Will you share with us what those adventures in those years were like for you? I, I grew up a, a horse racing fan in, in Maryland. My father uh, actually put in the sound system at Timonium, the Maryland State Fair, and that's how I hmm. first got involved with, uh, with racing. And uh, from there, uh, yeah, my, my buddies and I, uh, right from high school and you know, right out of that would head to tracks up and down the East Coast. We were just big fans of the game and certainly you know, loved, uh, loved being able to see tracks uh, all over the country and especially up and down the East Coast. So yeah, that's, that's how it kind of all started for me. And I decided that when I uh, started to hear the different race callers and their styles, that that was something I'd like to do. And uh, one, one day I just got a tape recorder, a pair of binoculars and went at it and uh, started practicing up at the Maryland press boxes and luckily they had a little space for me to do that and never imagined it would go where it did but uh but here we are so good to hear you called your first race at 18 is that correct mm -hmm. where was that Larry and how'd that happen so I was uh I was a, a gopher in the press box in Maryland and and there was practicing calling races and and one day uh the general manager of pimlico chick lang very very famous guy uh, synonymous with the preakness for years he was walking by the little room that i practiced calling races and his son was the the pr director uh chick lang jr and he said who's that kid uh calling races up there and they said that's larry he wants to be an announcer uh he says well let's um let's give him a chance so that summer a few weeks later Bowie Racetrack, which was uh, the, always the winter track in Maryland, uh, was running their last meet ever, but it was actually going to be during the summer. And uh, they said, hey, how about you start off as the backup announcer? Uh, Dick Woolley was the announcer in Maryland back then. They said, you could be Dick Woolley's backup and call one race a day over the microphone. And I was like, wow, that's cool. Yeah, let's do that. And I was 18. And uh, June 5th, 1985, Tierra's Flame, uh, trained by King Leatherberry, ridden by Bel Alberto Delgado, uh, won that race at Bowie, and uh, that's how things got kickstarted for me. Fantastic. Tierra's flame. Love it. You've been doing it for decades. Crazy history you have at uh, tracks like, like all the best, all the, all the big names, Gulfstream and, and Aqueduct and Saratoga and Belmont, and of course, Santa Anita, including the Breeders' Cup. What's this ride been like for you, Larry? In essence, a lot of hard work, obviously, a lot of dues paying. We know how that goes. It didn't happen overnight for you yet. 
You're the only one in this position getting ready to call your 14th straight Kentucky Derby for NBC. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a long, long process. Over the, you start as in my case as the backup announcer in Maryland for two years. Uh, then I got my first full time job at Birmingham, Alabama, at age 20 in 1987. Uh, on to Northern California for a few years. Called it Suffolk Downs in Boston. Uh, made my way uh, up and down the East Coast uh, to different tracks. Uh, including Monmouth Park, which is where I live now, not too far from there in New Jersey. Uh, you know, eventually got, uh, you know, Gulfstream Park in Florida. And then one day um, I, I got a phone call up in the, uh, up in the announcer's booth at, at Gulfstream Park. And uh, it was that day that I guess I became a 25-year overnight sensation. <laughs> After all the years of, of working the way up and paying my dues, I got a call from NBC Sports uh, asking me if I'd be interested in, in calling the, the Triple Crown because Tom Durkin was stepping down, the longtime voice of, of mm. NBC Sports Racing. And I, I had no idea, John, that, that Tom was stepping down. It was, it was not made public. And because of that, uh, I, uh, I decided that whoever is calling me is maybe playing a joke on me. I don't know. So anyway, I, uh, I ended up uh, saying, well, that's Tom Durkin's gig, right? And they said, well, Tom is stepping down, and, and that is, uh, that's not public information, but we want to meet you. And I went, I flew from Fort Lauderdale all the way to uh, LaGuardia. They picked me up there, spent the night uh, up in New York, and, and then went to 30 Rock in the morning and met with Fred Gaudelli, who was the person that called me, who was the... Legend. Uh, at, at the time was the uh, producer for the Triple Crown and Sunday Night Football. Uh, Rob Hyland, who then uh, was the producer, he was there at the meeting. Sam Flood, uh, who was the executive producer for NBC. And I remember one of the questions they asked me is, uh, you know, what, what's your favorite baseball team? And I said, well, the Boston Red Sox. And, and Fred and, and Rob walked away and said, and said, well, it was nice meeting you. And, and Sam high-fived me. So I knew I was okay with him. But, uh, That's great. but uh, anyway... Um, the one thing I'll never forget, and I love telling the story, I'm in Fred's office getting ready to head back to Florida. And, uh, you know, don't know how everything went. I was hoping it went okay. But I look, and right behind me, I see walking into the office, Dick Ebersole, the, wow. the big boss, right? And I'm like, the big wow, guy. This is, this is cool, right? Dick Ebersole's walking in. And he goes up to Fred, and he goes, hey, Fred, says, we got the schedule out for the NFL. We've got Peyton Manning and Tom Brady. You know, we got the Colts and the Patriots. we got this game. we got this game. And, and uh, Fred goes, well, Dick, this is Larry. We're talking to him about uh, replacing Durkin. And uh, he's like, yeah, okay, nice meeting you. we got this game and this game. And, you know, it was like I wasn't even there. And sure. then as, he, as he's walking out, he turns around. And I guess he was privy to my uh, reluctance on the phone when they first called. He's, he turns around and says, hey, Larry, do you believe us now? And I just like, holy mackerel. You know, this, <laughs> he's busting my chops. This has got to be good. And uh, that night, uh, after I flew back to Florida, I got the call from from Fred saying welcome to NBC Sports and it's it has been uh 14 years now it's unbelievable that uh I've, I've had the the chance to to call all these un incredible races and and be a part of the team of of NBC Sports I mean walking into the 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 trailer the first day and and Bob Costas walks up to me and says I know everybody mm. here except for you you must be Larry and uh what I should have said was to Costas and you are because I think he would have liked that. He would have. <laughs> but anyway, Bob has a great sense of humor. Yes, he, he does. He would. I think would have, yes. he would have enjoyed that. He's he's hit me with his sense of humor many times. Uh, it's it's very uh, wry for sure. And uh, anyway, but it, it's been just a, a treat to work uh, with all the people that I get to work with. I mean, uh, what one of my all time favorites, Tom Hammond, uh, who mm. hosted our show for many many years. He was so welcoming to me and so helpful. And then, of course, when, when Tom uh, retired, Mike Tarico came in, and he's been great. And, of course, all the guys I get to, get to work with, the guys and girls, are you know, so much fun. And, uh, man, it, 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 is a, it is a talented uh, yet uh, a family uh, group of people. We all love each other, and it, 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 I think it comes across that way on the air. 
So well said, unbelievable. Just that moment, those minutes alone, you're in Godelli's office, legend, and the man Dick Ebersol, legend, comes in and that exchange that's larry that's i'm pinching myself for you that's unbelievable yeah. and, when, uh, and when fred called me that night uh that's the one thing i i, I should have mentioned what i hung up the phone i i went outside I, I saw my friend who was waiting for me at the at the table at the restaurant i said i'll be right back and i, I walked outside and i just screamed <laughs> because it was just like a, a moment that you you i never saw coming and there was there's so many times calling at different tracks and, you know, being turned down, saying, uh, you know, you were second, you were our second choice. And, and all of a sudden, boom, the biggest one, number one hits. And uh, just a, a tremendous moment. And I've uh, enjoyed it so much. Unbelievable, Larry. We, we are now days from the big one. In the yeah. United States, I mean, the hallowed grounds of Churchill Downs, the Kentucky Derby. As mentioned, you've been the TV voice of the Derby for us for now. This will be the 14th uh, consecutive. So you have a certain schedule rhythm. Uh, take us there with you, Larry. What will you be doing, let's say, in the, the, the 24 hours leading up to the race? uh pacing <laughs> no uh, there there's a there's a whole lot of um uh, preparation obviously and it's it started months ago uh but but once i get there um you know i'll i'll actually get to churchill the week before because i my side gig is uh, actually pretty much my main gig is i work for fanduel tv uh as an mm -hmm. analyst and i'm going to be doing that the first couple of days of churchill downs and then uh starting on wednesday i switch hats to NBC and uh, we have meeting after meeting uh, you know of production meetings which are were always fun but at the same time I get myself out of a few of them because I need to go upstairs to my my booth and call some races and mm -hmm. so what I'll try to do is go up Wednesday Thursday uh, and call races in that booth just for my own sake you know and then we'll have a show on Friday uh, where we show the Kentucky Oaks on USA Network and a, and a bunch of other races and I'll be calling those live for NBC Sports so that's when I really get and and I haven't really called a race honestly uh, in months so you know mm. all this all this preparation is going to be helpful uh, leading up and and I've got all my uh, I've got all my index cards I'm just waiting for the the silks uh, for them to send me the uh, the silk so I can put them on this and I can study them over and over and over and over and over. Uh, but, um, you know, the whole idea, John, is when they when they step onto the track on um, Saturday uh, and they start playing my old Kentucky home, the horses running in this race better be your best friends by then. you got to know everything about mm. them. So that it's constant it's constant preparation, constant memory, um, you know, and, and then, you know, NBC will have some other things for me to do. I heard a rumor that I might be uh, teaching another famous sportscaster how to call a race. I don't have all the information wow. on that yet. But um, it's just kind of a, a fun uh, feature. So uh, I, I, that's all I can tell you as far as I know right now. <laughs> but oh, uh, that's, that's, that's... that we're going to tape during the week, and it, it's, it's going to be fun. It always is. That's fantastic. We will stay tuned for that. What does it feel like for you, Larry, as as the infield and grandstands and suites and beautiful people and fashion and the buzz and the crackle in the air as as Churchill Downs is popping? How does that feel from your vantage point? How are you able to stay calm in essence leading up to? Boy, I I'll tell you what. That that is the key question and i don't know the answer uh because i'm not calm uh i don't it, you'd have to be a robot to be calm and and you know for f when i first started in 2011 i knew one thing for sure because i was i i grew up as a horse racing guy right and i watched the kentucky derby every year i you know was so excited and when they started playing my old kentucky home i'd get chills you know it's mm. my goodness they're playing like so I said, 
I am not going to listen to that at all. So mm. they, they stepped onto the track. I took off my headphones because they're playing my old Kentucky home. Off they went, and I'm just looking at these horses, repeating their names over and over. Don't listen to the song. And and I was good good to go. I did that for about three, four years. Now I'm okay. I can listen to my old Kentucky home. I can soak it in. Um, but at the same time, it's all business. And man, when they... It, it doesn't get any easier, John. When, when they start walking to the gate, the outrider wearing the red jacket and the black cap, and 20 horses behind him start walking to the starting gate, your heart is like... And it's like, you know, you just, <sighs> just deep breaths, deep breaths, calm, calm, talking to yourself. Uh, you've done this 13 times, right? And, and, uh, and that's all you can do. And... You know, you try to settle yourself down as much as possible. And, um, you know, it, it. each and every year, other than that my old Kentucky home thing, it really doesn't get much easier. It, it's it's always a challenge to, to keep, you know, yourself calm enough to call the race. There's there's no, no worries about getting excited. That's going to happen. It's a matter of getting too excited and, and over the top and... You know, you just do do your best and, and, and hope that it comes out the way you want. Well, you, you do it so well. How do you get better, Larry? You just mentioned the, the silks and your, your cards and, and all of that preparation. How do you get better? That's a great question. And uh, what I, I try to set some goals, um, you know, as far as what I want to accomplish in the race call and, and one of them has always been the same and, you, and it's all, not always worked out that way but I I always try but by the time they reach the back stretch and they've gone that first half of a mile um, I always want to have called every horse in the race once hmm. up until that point and then I don't worry about calling them all again uh, you call as many as you can the ones that you think are in contention and you just call it like a regular horse race. But at that point, I want to get through all 20. And sometimes I don't get it done in time, but I will get all 20 in, you know, hopefully. Uh, that's always the goal. Um, and then outside of that, you know, I, I watch the replay of, of my calls in the past. You know, watch the replay of other announcers. Uh, mm -hmm. Travis Stone, who does a great job as the voice of Churchill Downs. Tom Durkin before me. Dave Johnson. You know, all these guys that have, that have called the race. And you know, just just kind of put it all together and just say, hey, what what am I? Is there anything I could be doing better? And you try to incorporate that into the call. The other thing I like to incorporate into the call, any features we're doing uh, on certain hmm. people in the race that are that people earlier in the broadcast got to meet, um, and uh, their you know their horses should get a special mention. The jockey, if it's a jockey, mention them during the call. Uh, you know, so. Little things, I mean, you always try to, to get better. Uh, if, if there's ever been a perfect race call, uh, I don't think I've ever heard one, and I know I've never made one. So, um, you know, you, you just keep at it and, you know, do the best you can. And uh, I, I'm glad you asked that question because I, I think it's going to make me work even harder <laughs> coming up to Saturday. Well, that, that's well said. And, and, and on that... Um... Larry, there's a fine line right between, because you're finding your rhythm, just like those horses and riders in, in right. an instant are finding their rhythm. There's a, is, am I wrong? Is there not a fine line between saying just enough or, or saying too much on the call? How do you find that rhythm? Because we're talking about an event that's a couple minutes, so you got to find it quick, right? Or, or how do you look at that? I think that's just experience. Uh, you know, having called tens of thousands of horse races and, and uh, you know, listening to different announcers, what do you like, what do you don't like? Um, I think you can, yes, definitely say too much, and I don't think that that's my style. Um, I try to say what I think is important um, and try to uh, paint a picture of what's going on in the race without getting too flowery and, um, you know, just... Just do your best. That's all, and uh, and do it like, like you do it. You know, don't don't. You know, when I was starting out, and when everybody starts out, they sound like somebody else, and then eventually you become you, and 
And that's all I can do, you know, just, just call it in my style. And, uh, you know, believe me, there's plenty of people that don't, that don't like my style and plenty of people that do. So I, I hear it on both sides. Just go on Twitter, that's, or X now as they call it, and, uh, and you'll see that. Everybody's got their opinion, that's for yes, sure. And so many, are, they're, they're in a hurry to share it. Um, that's, that's fascinating. Eventually, you become you. That, that's terrific. Talk about picking up a nugget. Thank you so much. You called, and we're, we're talking with and learning from the one and only Larry Colmas, the voice of the television broadcast for NBC of the Kentucky Derby. This will be the 14th straight year. Larry, you called the first Triple Crown winner in 37 years, American Pharaoh in 2015. As you prepared for the possibility of history at the Belmont, you sought insight from the previously mentioned, you mentioned Bob Costas, a man who knows what calling big sports events is all about. What insight did Bob offer to you, Larry, in terms of your approach to that potential moment and that call? Yeah, I, I think I reached out to Bob maybe the year before when California Chrome was going to go for the, mm. the Triple Crown because I did have a chance uh, that year to, to, to call that. And you know, I, I just wanted to, I can't remember exactly um, the Costas advice, but it was good. You know, it's just kind of giving, giving me an idea of, of what, was, what was appropriate for the moment. But the, the, the story I remember better is reaching out to Tom Hammond uh, because the uh, the day before it might have been two days before we're sitting there and I, I had gotten people in my ears saying hey you know you don't have to plan this out you know you just just how it comes out you know how you feel and blah 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 and I'm thinking hmm I don't know about that and um, I talked to Tom Hammond and uh, I said Tom what do you think and he he said Larry in his uh, Kentucky accent, he says, if you're going to call a moment of history, you better have the right thing to say. Mm -hmm. And I said, mm-hmm, yep, I, I agree. And I, so I kept thinking as the, as the days leading up went on, all right, what's everybody thinking if this happens? What, you know, what, what's, what's in everybody's head? Oh, the 37-year wait is over. He's finally the one. And that's what I said. You know, and, and that's, and to me that that, you know, was that in my head in advance? Sure it was. Yeah, I, want, I wanted to, and luckily the horse won by as many lengths as he did and, and let me say it, you know. And, and uh, one thing I, I know that, uh, that we all did was uh, as soon as I said he's won the Triple Crown as we laid out and then nobody said a word for the longest time. And we just let the crowd shots and reaction yes. take over. And then Tom Hammond came on and said, he did it. And mm. uh, I was like, tears, it's over. <laughs> and uh, just to be a part of that was just incredible. That is well said. Wow. Electric. Uh, and, and a key there in terms of the, as you said, the laying out. Because that's a fine line too. Sometimes somebody could have a tendency you know, get caught up in the moment and, and maybe over talk that thing. So that laying out was yeah. was mastery by by you. Um, by, by all of us. And, and all Rob of Highland you. was the producer and he mentioned it in the meeting. He thought that was a good idea. We're all like, yep, yep, yep. Lay out. That's, that's how we would, that's how we should do it. And it was perfect. So well done. You had an opportunity to meet American Pharaoh later. Is that correct? Will you share that with us? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I always wanted to 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 uh, get a chance to go up and see American Pharaoh in person. Uh, and he, uh, I was always busy, you know, during the Triple Crown, and and so was Bob Baffert, his trainer. And Bob and I have been, you know, known each other for years. And I, I texted him and I said, hey, um, when I found out that he was going to run in the Travers, and at the time I was calling the races in New York. And I was going to call the Travers for uh, the track there and, and for NBC. And I, I, said, uh, I said, can I meet him? Can I meet the horse? And he goes, yeah, you can meet the horse. So uh, the day before American Pharaoh ran in the 
Travers, they had him go out on the track just for a morning gallop. And 18,000 people showed up. It was just incredible, right? So after he did that, I got in a golf cart, headed to his barn, and there's barricades everywhere. And the security guard walked up to me, he said, Bob's been waiting for you. And I went, crawled under the barricade, <laughs> came on the other side, and here's American Pharaoh walking around getting his uh, cooling process done after his uh, morning work. And uh, Bob, Bob and I are just kind of talking, and then he says, says, okay, it's picture time. And here comes American Pharaoh over, and Bob hands me his lead and walks away. I'm not a hands-on horse person. I am holding the triple crown winner. He's looking at me. I'm looking at him. And he he's the calmest horse. Like if three years later, if that was justified, he would have you know, tried to kill me. American Pharaoh was just so gentle. And he was like, oh, huh, nice to meet you. You know, and what a, what a thrill. I've got photos of that. And then I got to see him later at, um, you know, at, at his stud farm. And, and he's just... I remember the cameras going off and <laughs> and he knew exactly where they were. So he like would turn his head toward the cameras because he was so smart. It was, it was an amazing horse. Unbelievable. Thanks so much for sharing that. Talk about special moments. So and and just a, a couple more for you, Larry. Know you're busy yeah. and so appreciative of, of your time with us, learning so much. So so you call the first Triple Crown winner in 37 years. Then, remarkably, three years later, you're on the call for another hello, another Triple Crown winner, as you just mentioned, Justify. It's, it's insane to ponder yeah. that it happens the first time in almost 40. You're on the call. It happens again a few years later. You're on the call. There are so many who've come before you. It never happened for them, that honor. Uh, there, there may well be so many after you. Um, it may never happen again like that within a few years. Describe what that was like, calling the second one, and how you look at that now, Larry. Well, Chick, An Chick Anderson still has me beat. He called three. <laughs> but gotcha. uh, that was back in the 70s but modern and, uh, history yeah, yeah yeah so so now uh poor tom durkin who was one of the best if not the best to ever do it called the races in new york for 24 years and had nine chances and none of them won and then i st i step in and boom but that's just that's just the way it worked out but uh justify i i feel bad for justify because American Pharaoh took away all of his glory by doing it first. Uh, but Justify was a, a, it was special too because anytime it's a triple crown, it's special. The one thing I'll remember about Justify more than anything was his preakness because it was shrouded in fog. You couldn't see a thing. And the, the NBC people, um, uh, Pierre was, the, uh, was the, the director at the time, Pierre Moussa, and, and he... He picked out all the camera shots so that we could actually see the race. Because, I mean, I call the race through binoculars. They're useless in the fog that you can't see through. So th during the commercial breaks, they're showing me all the angles. And I'm preparing myself as to what I'm going to be able to see. And, uh, and so I called that whole preakness off of TV monitors using whatever the people watching on television saw and uh, it was a it was a challenge but it was a, it was a lot of fun unbelievable and you mentioned the binoculars i want to ask you uh, when you go to those for for seconds and and then you put them away is there any disorientation or again is that part of the experience you, you use them you've got it they're gone and you're locked in still not missing a yeah. beat so to speak yeah i yeah you get used to it after a while you you, you kind of know where they are on the track every once in a while i I, I've taken a second to say, oh, what, where are they? oh, they're over here. But yeah, I, that that's very rare. <laughs> gotcha. And and finally, and and again, Larry, so thankful for the time you've taken with us in a very busy time for you leading up to the Kentucky Derby on Saturday. 
your thoughts on on being even almost by default uh, an ambassador, if you will, of the sport. You know, it's given you, we, we just talked about some signature historic moments. It's given you so much. Talk about the importance of continuing to share your passion, love for the sport with others. Oh, it's very important to me, you know, and, and uh, I, I always enjoyed my, my days when I was calling the races at Saratoga, New York, and walking around the, uh, after I gave the program changes an hour before the first race, just walking around and saying hi to people. And, and uh, you know, it, it's just, to me, uh, it's, it's a great part of the, the sport to be able to, to you know, be down there and, and say hi to people and, and, you know, answer their questions and, you know, take pictures or whatever, you know, it's, and I, I was so funny the other day, I was at Gulfstream Park in, in Florida and Tom Brady was at the track. And I'm I'm like trying my best to to go get a picture with Tom Brady because I'm like he's Tom Brady and two people stopped to take a picture with me and I'm trying to take a picture with Tom Brady. I thought that that was hysterical, but uh, but it's funny you know at the Derby because I, I think a lot of people that are there aren't like necessarily people that go to the track all the time. So I can walk around there and no one has a clue who I am. So <laughs> it's just. It, but it is fun when when people stop by and, and say hello. I I really enjoy it. Well, that that what a what a cool thing on the so you never got to Brady. Maybe next time I did get to you Brady. Know, maybe it, I did. Oh, you did get to him. Okay, did. you did get to did. him. I've got. I, in fact, I, I was going to take a, a selfie with him, and my hand was like this, and he just says, "Give me the phone." <laughs> He took it. <laughs> oh, Larry, that's fantastic. Oh, my goodness. So, yeah, you closed the deal. That, that's <laughs> awesome. Um, wow. There he is, everybody. The hardest, I'll say it, the hardest working man in horse race broadcasting uh, brings us so much, <laughs> so much joy. Larry Colmus. Larry, thank you again for joining us at Says Who Sports. Have a great derby. And, of course, We'll be tuned in. Thank you, John. My pleasure. And uh, hopefully everybody will uh, cash a few tickets at the Kentucky Derby. Amen. Thanks, Larry. You got it. Thank you, John. <laughs>